and we give us scripture. Yeah, yeah. Scripture, it so, should be a present, you know? Scripture should be present. I want to talk today about the importance for Christians of the solidity of the soul, of solidifying your soul as a Christian. And I want to talk about it because in the Western Christian church today, there are too many examples of easy come, easy go Christians. Christians who drop Christianity at the drop of a hat, who abandon the faith almost overnight. And I think it is because as Christians, we are not cultivating the solidity of the soul. Now, what do I mean by solidity of the soul? I mean by solidity of the soul, this idea of self-assurance, self-confidence, self-assertion, self-energizing, self-responsibility of your Christian identity and living it outward in your life. The apostles instructors in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 it says be on the alert stand firm in the faith act like men be strong let all that you do be done in love you see the meek man christianity that passes for so much of western christianity is not the christianity that is taught in the bible the bible teaches the idea of a self-assured self-confident faith it says that we are to be on alert that means to be aware of our surroundings to be aware of how have we lost anything good that we have to be aware of how our faith is um to to stand firm how we are to be aware of how our society impacts us and affects us but many christians are not aware of how they are imbibing and absorbing ideologies and beliefs values that are not rooted in the christian faith the scriptures say to be alert it also says to stand firm in the faith well stand firm against what against opposition against those that would oppress us against those that would stand against us against those who would seek to make us non-christian in our values non-christian in our beliefs like those who demand that we accept political ideologies that are not compatible with christian values like multiculturalism or those that demand that we accept belief systems that are not compatible with a christian worldview like relativism we Christians must reject all of these things and stand firm in the faith. We must act like men. What does it mean to act like a man? It means to shoulder responsibility without wavering. It means to bear your load. It means to stand upright, chest out, chin up, walk forward. Not to shrink, not to shrivel, not to cower. But so many Christians are wimps because the kind of church culture that we've developed in the West is anything but acting like a man. It's acting like a boy, like a child, a snowflake Christianity that melts under the slightest consideration of heat. In 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy, verses 18 to 19, it reads, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. We are called as Christians to fight the good fight. That means that you stand up for Christian values. When Christianity says that abortion is wrong and the world says that abortion is right, then we Christians take on the motto Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world, Ecclesium contra mundum, the church against the world. We Christians are called to fight valiantly under the banner of Christ against sin, the world and the devil. 
And that means that when the state says to us that it has redefined marriage, we say you have only redefined marriage for you, not for us. We reject your redefinition. The sacrament stands as given by God that marriage is between a man and a woman. When the state says that your gender can change, that a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man, we say that that is what you believe, that is not what we believe. And if you accuse us of a hate crime, then so be it. Being a martyr is a part of what it means to be a Christian. We are called to fight the good fight of faith. It says keeping the faith with a good conscience. That means you keep it, you instill it within yourselves. You live it out in the choices that you make, in the values that you choose to live by, even if that means you suffer. Doing things in good conscience means that if you are convicted in your conscience that you cannot go along with a state and its teaching or with an ideology and its beliefs as no Christian can when it comes to liberal progressive thought, communist thought, nationalistic thought, Nazism, fascism or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, it means that we stand against these ideologies that we fight the good fight. Fighting the good fight means that you use your intelligence and your wit. You don't just charge into the crowd like a brawler, you use strategy, you use tactics, you outwit your opponent. That's how you win fights. You don't win fights by just standing there and letting them pound you from all sides. But you do it in good conscience because as your faith solidifies, as your identity as a Christian grows, you will find that it impacts what your conscience tells you you can and cannot do. And so you must be in good conscience because God, one of the things that God will judge you for is how you kept a good conscience, how you kept the conscience that he gave you, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Those Christians who have given up their identity in politics as a Christian, or their identity in society as a Christian, or their identity in economics as a Christian, have allowed other ideologies to dominate those spheres. And then as those Christians have entered those spheres, they have been influenced by the values and the beliefs of others over how they should act as Christians. And so Christians who increasingly build into their souls untruths, lies about the Christian faith ultimately end up being shipwrecked because they reach a point where Christianity no longer makes sense to them. And so they give up the faith because now it doesn't make sense to be a Christian according to how they live. And it is because they have not Christianized their lives. In Hebrews 3, 1, 6, we read, Therefore, my holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also in his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. If we hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope firm until the end, what we mean as Christians when we say the solidity of the soul is that the soul is a garden, the soul is a house, it is a work of art, it is not an accident. You have to cultivate the soul, you have to bejewel the soul, you have to weed the soul, you have to lay good foundations for the soul. You must develop your soul as a Christian. And that means that as a Christian, you build yourself on the values of the Christian faith, the doctrines of the Christian faith, 
You root yourself in the history of the Christian faith. You allow the traditions and the customs of the Christian faith to infuse the way you live daily. Now, we as Christians are called to have, sorry, bear with me. We are called to have, sorry. We are called to have, three, one, two, three. We are called to have, there we go. But if a man, no, that's why I'm on the wrong page. Sorry, let me just go back to it. Hebrews 3, 1 to 6. Let's just go back there. Just a quick question, JC. Yeah. When you were away from the camera, did we lose anything? Nothing. Okay, brilliant. Hebrews 3, 1 to 6. Um, we are called to hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope. Christians in the West have become bashful and shy of their identity as Christians. We have become ashamed of our own culture, ashamed of our own history, ashamed of our own faith, ashamed of our own doctrines. And so we meekly go about living as Christians whilst the rest of the world believes that it has um, permission to be confident and boastful in what they believe. But as Christians, we are instructed by the apostles to boast of our hope. We're commanded to boast of our hope. That means to boast of our identity as Christians, as the people of the cross. We are commanded to hold fast to our confidence, which means as Christians, we are to have confidence in our faith. So, I'm going to give some ways that as Christians, you can cultivate the solidity of the soul. The solidity of the soul can be understood as confidence, self-assurance, assertiveness. This is what we mean by the solidity of the soul. So how can you now as Christians cultivate solidity of the soul? One is learn the history of the Christian people. We are a people that have traversed 2,000 years of human history and we have been implanted in every nationality, in every ethnicity of the world. Learn your faith as a Christian, because when you become a Christian, you stop being English, you stop being Nigerian, you stop being Ghanaian, you stop being Iraqi, you stop being Assyrian, and you become Christian. Take pride in your identity, your history as a Christian, where that history permits. Learn the values of the Christian faith and take pride in them. Live by those values. Live by them publicly. And if by living by them publicly, you are persecuted for do so, then celebrate that they persecute you for being a Christian because they persecuted our Lord before you. Learn the doctrines of the Christian worldview. Allow those doctrines to change the way you think about the world. Change the way you think about right and wrong, truth and false, up and down. Allow it to impact all that you are. Cultivate Christian customs and traditions into your life. The Christian faith has borne multiple customs multiple traditions that our faith has embedueled the western world with have bejeweled assyria with have bejeweled ethiopia with have bejeweled egypt with have bejeweled lebanon with have bejeweled russia with these customs and these traditions are the inheritance of every christian and so like a good artist, so like a good builder, so like a good gardener, cultivate these things into your soul so that it bejewels your life in the same way. Invest yourself in your Christian identity. Invest yourself 
in your Christian friendships, your Christian marriage, your Christian family, your Christian community, Christian businesses, Christian political parties, Christian political agendas, Christian economics. Embed yourself in these Christian things so that you solidify your Christian identity, especially in politics. Find ways personally to cultivate the sentiments of the solidity of the soul through your how it determines your pride, your identity. Resolve within yourself by choice to affirm your Christian identity whenever that Christian identity is challenged. Remember always to have solidity and solidarity with persecuted Christians. Nothing will make you more resolved to stand as a Christian if you keep before yourself in memory the blood of the martyrs in Nigeria, the blood of the martyrs in Egypt, the blood of the martyrs in Ethiopia, the blood of the martyrs in Iraq, the blood of the martyrs in Syria, the blood of the martyrs in Pakistan, the blood of the martyrs in Korea, the blood of the martyrs in Burma, the blood of the martyrs in China. They demand, they demand a response upon the soul of every Christian around the world. And nothing will make you more determined to stand as a Christian if you remember the blood of the martyrs and the cause of the confessors. Read often the lives of Christian champions of old, the Agios, the Holies, the Saints, those who went before us in that great pilgrimage of faith towards our heavenly home. Remember what they went through, the challenges that they faced, the cost that it cost them to be a Christian in the face of opposition, and seek to emulate them in your own walk as a Christian. Practice spiritual devotions towards our Lord because, and the Christian church is replete with advice and guidance upon spiritual devotions. Just type into Google Christian spiritual devotions and you will find a legion of advice and guidance about how you can cultivate spiritual devotion. devotion. Finally, and then I'm going to open up to questions. Affirm your Christian identity publicly. Do not be ashamed of the cross. Wear your cross. Do not be ashamed of dressing like a Christian modestly, even if others think that it is strange. Do not be ashamed to pray. Do not be ashamed to profess the gospel. Affirm your faith publicly, whatever the cost. So those are ways that you can cultivate the solidity of the soul as you are instructed to by apostolic teaching. Any questions? Sir, the Christian church has not been a sodality no, since that. the time of the great schism in about 1261. So do you stand with Athanasius or with Sergius? Okay, so the question is, that Christians have been divided in history. So who do I stand with? Athanasius or someone else? Yeah, that's Sergius. The answer is I stand with Athanasius because Athanasius stood against Arianism. And Arianism is a heresy condemned by the church in 325, by the collective will of the bishops of the church. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Christian identity is not rooted, is not rooted in the institutions of the Christian community. It is rooted in a system of beliefs and values and the shared heritage and history of those people who uphold those values and those beliefs. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Do you believe that Christians in this country are being persecuted at the minute under coronavirus legislation? So, are Christians being persecuted under coronavirus legislation? No, absolutely not. 
The reason why I say this is because that legislation applies to everyone. It doesn't just apply to Christians. If it only applied to Christians, then we could say that it was discrimination or persecution. However, Muslims have to follow the same legislation. Jews have to follow the same legislation. The humanist society has to follow the same legislation. We Christians must not, must not scandalize the cause of the martyrs by claiming victimhood where victimhood does not exist. If we claim that we are being persecuted falsely in this country, we make a mockery of Christians who are dying for their faith by the thousands in Nigeria, or dying for their faith by the thousands in Sudan, or in Ethiopia, or in Pakistan, or in Iraq, or in Syria. So there should be no claiming of false victimhood. And that is an example of false victimhood. Any other questions? I can't hear you, bro. You got a mask on and then another mask on. So, the brother is saying, what about the people that are being killed by Christians in all those other places? What example would he like to talk about? Iraq? Go on, give me an example. Yes. Only a handful now are left. The eradication of the South American Indians, eradication within one generation of 90% of the population, eradication that happened in Africa, eradication that happened in all those places, and colonization of those places, by support under the Bible, and the genocide that advocated by Lord Jerry himself, in the Bible himself, Okay, so let me address the point, and hopefully the brother will not interrupt. However, I cannot take lectures from Muslims about discrimination and persecution. I will address the examples that he gave in a summary line. The New Testament, the New Test, notice he's interrupting. What a surprise. Where have we heard this kind of behavior before? So ladies and gentlemen, he's raised a question. Now let me answer the question as I choose to. So ladies and gentlemen, Islam, has within its teachings and the example of its prophet, genocide. When the Banu Quraysh, a Jewish tribe, were conquered by Muhammad, Muhammad oversaw the mass murder of over 900 Jewish men. That is the best example that Muslims have, and they say that that is their example today. Thank you very much, Bob. By comparison. Christians follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would like to see where does Jesus Christ command a Christian to carry out a genocide. Thank you very much. Now, by his, his right to point out, the colonial period did lead to mass death. In Latin America, because of viruses and germs that we carried with us. In Australia, because of a combination of viruses and germs and also wars that we exacted upon the Aborigines. Christians' hands are not bloodless. We have done wrong, but we Christians are able to say that we did wrong. But what about when the Muslims ethnically cleansed the Christians of South Sudan? like they did within our lifetimes? What about when Muslims are slaughtering Nigerian Christians right now as we are all talking? We Christians have changed our ways. The Muslims for 1400 years have continued to butcher and murder like ISIS did in Iraq and Syria in a direct copy of what the Ottoman Empire did, and what the Abbasids did, and what the Umayyads did. 1400 years of murder, rape and pillage. And who is the example that all of these Muslims appeal to, to justify their actions? Mohammed. So I don't need any lectures from go. that. Yes, thank you. Let's try it. Any other questions? You've asked a question, let someone else ask. Let someone else ask a question. Just, yes, go on. My question is, 
So does not is not every movement affected by other forces and powers such as economics and stuff like that? I don't know if I'm right. I heard you say that Christians have stopped slaughtering and the Muslims haven't. I think it's just a, a, a a moment in time where it looks like that. I think the Christians could start any minute and the Muslims could stop any minute. It's something much deeper than that. But, uh, okay. so one side's okay and the other one isn't quite so let, let me address that point. So, so don't, don't, don't feed the trolls. If you feed the troll, they just feel entitled. I'm opening up to questions. I've took a question for the lady. This brother needs to learn better manners than Muhammad. So, better manners than Muhammad. The lady asked, are not all ideologies, and just, I want to make sure I capture your question properly. The lady asked, the lady, they killed another priest in Italy, you idiot. Brother, he's right, he's right, he's right. But the liberals don't talk about that. They don't talk about Christophobia. Why, Only, Islamophobia. Only Islamophobia. Where's the lectures about the desecrations of our churches going off in France right now? Where's the lectures of the desecration of churches going off in America right now? Where's the lectures about the desecration of churches going off in Italy right now? Where's the lectures about the murder of Christian priests in Italy and France? Did we hear lectures about Christophobia no. from our politicians? No. Not one. Not one. Why? Because the liberal do good of virtue signaling hypocrites are only able to see one kind of prejudice. And it's filtered through ethnicity. So that means because, because Islam is a mainly ethnic religion, we can't talk about the prejudices emanating from within the Islamic community. But we can talk about Islamophobia because Islamophobia is mainly perpetrated by white nationalists. So that's the problem that we have. And we Christians, brother, stop feeding the trolls, please. Brother, brothers and sisters, focus on me, please. We Christians need to be better at calling out the hypocrisy of liberals and forcibly challenging them in the media, on question time, in political hustings, to call out Christophobia and not ignore it. But they do. But now coming back to the lady's question, that's why you shouldn't jump in. Coming back to the lady's question, the question is, are not all ideologies affected by economic societies, by economic and social influences? Have I captured your question correctly? So I've captured the question correctly. The lady is right. Every ideology is affected by socio-economic truths. I'm raising my voice because of the lady behind. So, that is a truth established by Karl Marx. He made a right observation about how economies impact societies. But let me tell you a truth that we Christians have learned over 1400 years. When anti-Christian ideologies like communism, Nazism and Islam dominate the political, the sociological and the economic Murray bounds and norms of society, Christians are persecuted. We Christians have suffered a hundred years of persecution at the hands of the communists. We Christians have suffered 1400 years of continuous persecution at the hands of Islamic states. Why should I not oppose such ideologies, when such ideologies oppose me, when such ideologies will lead to my persecution and the persecution of my brothers and sisters. It is not a crime to stand up against a tyrannical ideology. We're all okay to stand up against Nazism. 
and we should. We're all okay to stand up to communism and we should. But that means logically we can all stand up to Islam and Islamification and we should. Don't be ashamed to stand up to a tyrannical ideology. Islam leads to the persecution of the church. It is persecuting the church right now. It has persecuted the church for 1400 years and it is time that we Christians get a spine, grow some balls and stand up for our Christian faith. These questions about the mask and about wearing the mask are a total distraction to the real issues the church faces and it is an embarrassment that so many Christians have bought into the anti-lockdown protests and the BLM protests. If you're a Christian and you can protest against these things, then why can you not protest against the mass murder of Christians in Nigeria, the bombings of churches in Pakistan, the, the legal discrimination against Christians in Malaysia, against the Christian discrimination in Indonesia, against the fact that in Saudi Arabia you can't even legally be a citizen and a Christian at the same time. Where is your consistency, O Church? Any other questions? Okay. Are there any other questions or are we all done? Okay. So the brother raises a question about Christians being threatened in their workplaces because they are standing up for their Christian faith. It's a good point. And what it demonstrates, ladies and gentlemen, is that we Christians need to consolidate ourselves. We need to consolidate our community so that we have geographical and political space where we can control our own economic fate, where we establish Christian businesses, where brothers like this can speak the truth and not be in fear that their employers will discriminate against them. We Christians need to establish our own social network platforms to allow Christians to speak their faith. We Christians need to network with one another so that we employ our brothers and sisters and claim space in the economy and support Christian businesses. But for those of us, and so I encourage every Christian, go and work for a Christian company. Go and work for a company owned by Christians. For those of you like the brother who cannot, I would say to you, use your discernment. Make your social profile posts private. Evangelize quietly, not in your workplace. Just go to work, do your job, make friends, and outside of the workplace, on a day you were never working, meet for those non-Christian friends for a coffee and evangelize them there. We Christians are called to be wise as serpents. But right now, too many of our brothers and sisters who are willing to stand up for the faith do so without cunning, without strategy, without wisdom, without prudence. It is not against the Christian faith to strategize or to use tactics. So start to use them and start to take over businesses so that when you're in a position to do so and you have the choice to employ 
two people who are equally skilled to do the job, but you know one of them is a Christian, employ the Christian. Because I promise you, that is exactly what the liberal progressives are doing. They're doing it in the state, they're doing it in business, and they're even doing it in the Church of England. Who? Any other questions? Well, before you answer, let me, let me, no, 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 let me change okay. the battery. Just changing the battery. Do you want to? Okay, questions. Finally, are there any other questions before I finish? In that case, brothers and sisters, all of you who by your heritage and your culture have Christianity at your roots, I encourage you to embrace it again with the confidence that was spoken of by the apostles, to interweave that spirituality in your life and to once again stand firm as Christians. Ecclesium contra mundum, the church against the world. Praise the Lord. Amen.